Hello and welcome again, 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 again. I always was singing in the Wisdom Factory. Welcome to the Wisdom Chats. This is the intermediate chat series mm -hmm. between our seasons because mm -hmm. we have finished the first season and we will start the second season in May 6th. Yes. So in the meantime, we invite people like me and you and you <laughs> just to talk about our common learning we have done the superhuman operating system course mm -hmm. of ken wilber lately and it was really interesting and last week we talked with bettina hartmann and this week we will talk with lawrence gold hello lawrence hello hello and we are fortunate that he came in because last time he couldn't. And <laughs> we will see what, what, come out, what comes out today if some other gremlins are behind the door. One is there because there's no comment tracker. Disappeared. But you know what? No, most people don't know what a comment tracker is. Oh, comment tracker is a thing. When yeah. you, audience, and I see somebody is here like Tom, uh, AKTZ4 and Paula oh. and somebody else. Wait. I don't know. I, I, you know, I have to switch from one computer to the other. Anyway, who is here? Welcome, welcome, and enjoy being here and write your comments, and we will read them. We cannot bring them up because when comment tracker is there and working, we could bring up your comments right on the screen. In this case, we will read them and make you participant mm. of our show. You mean, do we have to answer their questions? Sure we do. What if we don't know the answers? <laughs> ah, okay. Right. We will find out. I'll make one up. always a three-word answer. Yeah. <laughs> Minimum three. Is that, I don't know. I don't know. That's, that's a three-word answer. Yes, it is. Mm -hmm. So, uh, Lawrence, would you like to introduce yourself a little bit uh, to the audience, and then we ask you some questions and we begin to talk. Good heavens, introduce myself. I'm unprepared. I, okay. <laughs> well, let's see here. Just what comes to mind. I started my meditation practice at age 19, about the same period of time as I was getting my first series of rolfing sessions. For those who don't know about rolfing, it's an innovative form of body work that was developed in the late 60s mm -hmm. that has as its intention, according to the developer, the developing development of a more efficiently functioning human being. Uh, Dr. Rolf, Ida Rolf called it structural integration. It was not intended as a therapeutic modality, but actually as a mode of personal growth, but it has since been altered in its use by many people as a therapeutic modality. Mm -hmm. My Rolfer introduced me to Daphri John, who was at that time known as Franklin Jones, then Bubba Free John, and a host of other people. Oh, names. okay. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> he got me to read the Yoga Sutras of Patanjali. And I, he was my, my first major teacher. He was the one who introduced me into the path of conscious development. One of his sayings to me was, do what you do, whatever you do, but do it consciously. Okay. Mm -hmm. So I was introduced by him. His name was Jim Price. He's in California. And that began a, a series of developments that led up to very recently where each period of time I would practice intensively, generally for about 20 years, a given course of practice before spontaneously evolving to the next, being introduced to what the next would be. So what started out as an introduction to yoga, meditation and body work led to increasingly sophisticated teachings that have given me access to depths in myself that were previously unavailable. One of the major things that has occurred for me has been a recognition that there is no mind-body connection. 
There is also no mind-body split. The reason being, <laughs> there are not two. There is only one. Yes. But if we conceptualize it, we may conceptualize it in two different conceptual frameworks. And people confuse typically concepts with actuality because we live in a heavily mental verbal mind world culture in which actual experience has been put into the second position to mental understanding, which is second rate, no matter what you do. The most benefit we can get from mental understanding is to be directed to put our attention into direct experience. Yeah. You see? So I think okay. that's all the introduction of me you need, huh? <laughs> <laughs> What you last said reminds me of uh, uh, Eastern teaching of pointing out instructions. Exactly. You know, not conf not confusing the finger with the thing that's pointing to. <laughs> I yeah. once tried that with a dog. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, <laughs> and instead of the dog looking where I was pointing, the dog was looking at my finger. You know, so exactly. <laughs> and, and this is typically what happens often with pointing out instructions is that people get lost in the instructions mm -hmm. and the word meanings of the instructions mm -hmm. and don't have the, the wherewithal, the resources developed in them to attend directly to what the instructions are pointing to. Well, you know, this brings up a question because we've just finished this uh, superhuman operating system course. It is. Uh, all three of us, uh, Heidi was an auditor, shall we say. That is, I yes. paid and she listened. You know? She looked over your shoulder and listened. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And uh, there, there were an awful lot of words in that course. You betcha. Yeah. And so how, I'm just wondering, <clears throat> what was the value to you? with all this experience with meditation and these 20 year practices you've been telling us about, you know, to, to come in contact uh, in some depth with integral thought, a la Ken Wilber. Well, I have been reading Ken Wilber for decades also, the same individual ah. that Rolfer one day brought to his house, uh, we were guests visiting, he brought out a copy of Up from Eden Oh, wonderful. And yeah. I had seen the Atman Project in the local bookstore, and so I was familiar with Ken Wilber for a long time, and I got the original program, the Superhuman Operating System, long before this course, when it was presented on, uh, as a, I think it was a DVD set. Mm -hmm. So without elaborating further, let's just say I was fairly familiar with the full structure of what the super operating system comprises before I took that course. Okay, I would like to ask you, when you hear superhuman potential or su what we call our show now, no? Or superhuman operating system, it sounds a little bit... Mm -mm -mm -mm. Presumptuous? Maybe arrogant. presumptuous, um... arrogant. What is your understanding of this superhuman thing? Okay, it comes down to one word, integration. Now, as people develop, we gradually bring online different faculties in ourselves, which in the superhuman operating system, they call lines of intelligence. Mm -hmm. And as examples, we have people who have musical talents, so they have a musical line of intelligence that's available for development. There's mathematical, linguistic, emotional, and uh, according to Ken, about 20 other identified lines of intelligence. These are brought online not all at once, not all at the same time for the different lines, and not all at once on offer any given line. It starts out gradually, and it goes through the stages that have been described as unconscious incompetence, 
conscious incompetence. That means you know you don't know enough about something. Well, I'm that far anyway. Okay. <laughs> Me too. Yeah. And then conscious competence, and that's where you're deliberately acting. And this is the person who's undergoing a process of mastering something. Okay. And then they call it unconscious competence, which really should be second nature competence. So the development of the lines of intelligence undergo those general steps. And without getting into too much detail, let's just say that when I said integration, it means that we don't inter awaken all of those all at once. They all often awaken at different times and to different degrees. And we become more and more capable in those different areas. Now, one of the lines of intelligence has been called spiritual intelligence. And to be really clear about what that entails, <clears throat> it has to do with two directions of development that the superhuman operating system presents. One is what's called growing up. And this is where we go from a pretty egocentric state of development to a family and culture state that's called ethnocentric, then world-centric, where we have room in ourselves for the different ethnocentric orientations and we can see their strengths and weaknesses, and then cosmocentric, in which we're not merely centered on Earth world and the humans of Earth world, but all life forms of the planet and all potential life forms and all potential domains of experience cosmocentrically. That means every possible experience within reach of human attention, mm -hmm. which is what we call gigantic and unknowable. <laughs> now we, so getting back to integration, we gradually develop faculties also in those stages of development from being egocentric or narcissistic as the infant is who doesn't even know that he or she is narcissistic there she is, or he is just self-centered i'm hungry my diaper's wet whatever does uh, can i interrupt you a little bit uh, does anybody know that they are narcissistic normally when they're really narcissistic? Uh, this is a psychological question. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's a good one. I, and I think the answer would be no. Nobody who's narcissistic knows it. Well, it's certainly I don't. <laughs> yes. <Okay>. Come on. <laughs> anyway. Stop, you're confusing me. <laughs> <laughs> so getting back to integration, I just outlined okay. one direction of development, uh, of development growing up. Right. There is the other direction, which is called waking up. And that's easily understood. We, everyone experiences three common states, waking, dreaming, and deep sleep. Those are increasingly subtle uh, experiences of consciousness. And then there are two further, which are the Turaya, some call it Turiya, Mm -hmm. which is the consciousness of and that includes waking, dreaming, and sleeping, deep sleep. And then there's what is called Torayatita, which is beyond that fourth, in which even that disposition of inclusive consciousness is also witness, witnessed, witnessable or observable, but without being stuck in any of those positions. And also yeah. recognizing that they all originate within the same living process that we are. And that's a non-dual condition. Getting back to there is no mind-body separation. There is no mind-body connection. The reason being, there ain't two to be connected or separated. They're just different functions of the living being mm -hmm. that we may then label conceptually and consider to be different, but only conceptually. I would like to bring it a little bit down to earth. You are working with the body, don't you? <laughs> when there is no connection between body and mind, but you are working with the body, and I think with a certain direction and with a certain intent. So, Okay. Well, okay. this so, is something that some people, uh, how they would say it. Uh, but I don't say that I'm working with the body at all. 
And I don't say that I work on people at all. I work with people. And what I'm doing in my work is teaching. And not mental word teaching, but action, feeling teaching. And by that process, people gain control. Let me, let me interrupt and say, why do people come to me? Because that makes a difference. Most, uh, almost everybody who comes to me for services in somatic education, which is what it's called, and I'll elaborate if I need to in a moment, they're in pain, physical pain. And most of them have been the medical route. They've been also to body workers, acupuncturists, uh, osteopaths, physical therapists, and have not gotten what they needed. And the reason being that all of those pro approaches are working as if they're working on a body and the person is kind of passively receptive to all of that. Yeah. Okay. My work requires 50% participation from my clients, 50% from me, and what I'm doing is, in effect, pointing out instructions. Only the purpose of these instructions is to get them to do things and to notice what those things feel like as they do them. And by that means, they're creating memory impressions in themselves, of themselves, which are different from that, or those memory impressions that go along with their pain that they walk in the door with. Now, here's the thing about memory. Memory isn't just the memory of senses and sensations. It's also the memory of reactions and actions, mm -hmm. which are always patterns of movement and tension. Mm -hmm. So having given you that background foundation, the people who come to me are stuck in reaction to events that occurred back when that triggered <laughs> contraction action in themselves mm -hmm. so hard that they, those contraction actions hurt. So the memories are of their contractions, not of the actual event that no, produced it, that. Well, it's no, it, it's both. The actual event has left an impression in them as if it's still happening and they're still tightening up. And you see this in people who limp when they walk or one shoulder is down all the time or they have chronic pain from muscular contractions. These are all the signs of a residual memory from either injury or long-term stress, which Ken would call um, breakdowns at the different fulcra or tipping points of maturation. Yeah. It's like here it is in a, in a tipping point, you're growing, growing, and growing, you grow enough, and all of a sudden you've grown further beyond what is really needed by you and your attention comes free and it begins to tip and send you downhill into the next increment of growth. That's a tipping point or a fulcrum as Ken uses the term. But people I'm getting often confused. Have I'm getting confused. You were you were moving horizontally there, but you're actually well, I'm moving falling. up and then yeah. down. Okay. okay. Gotcha. So when a person has a trauma, they have a distortion in their growth process, which exists as a memory in them, or many memories. And those memories have a grip that distorts the person's functioning along the lines of intelligence. So they become tongue-tied, they develop a stutter, they develop emotional restrictions and restraints from emotional trauma. And those are just examples of many ways that a person can develop a breakdown in some line of development. What happens is that that breakdown in memory is generally, at, at first it's vivid, but it fades out. You forget the incident and just have the residual effect. Uh, mm -hmm. And they don't know they've got it. And we call that shadow material. So I don't know why I have this pain in my back anymore. It's a shadow. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it's it's very interesting. And uh, I feel a little bit reminded of what I did in Berlin. It was called breath therapy, where we, um, Mittendorf, I don't know if you know that. It, it was, is Mittendorf. Yeah, mm -hmm. Mittendorf, yeah. Uh, yeah. And it was not so elaborated in integral, but it was the same thing. We tried to do so 
slow movements to to find out how the movement feels and to 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 how to say to to break the the patterns to break the patterns which were there before no when put up the arm like this and you take everything with your uh, in it was very liberating i mean hearing it like you do it like you explain it now it's it's more complex but i would like to go back to the superhuman thing you were talking about okay. the lines and right. you but the f very first thing i wanted to say you seem to be coming into integral by the more by the spiritual from the spiritual f uh, part and less from the psychological so part is more that waking up than growing up i don't know i ask okay. Uh, well, okay. you Actually, i'm coming in through the somatic line i gotta i've gotta correct something a misconception about somatic <clears throat> somatic does not mean sensory motor that just pertains to the first seven years of life somatic is a description of the human being as the aqual or four quadrant matrix that Ken Wilber synthesized. Can you say an Atimino? This is Italian. <laughs> Can you say a moment what that is? Because there might yeah. be people uh, who don't know that. Sure. Like me. Mm -hmm. Come on. Okay. <laughs> All right. So I'm going to be summary about this. Mm -hmm. Everyone has a minimum of three basic viewpoints when we're mature. And one is I, the self, the other is you, the living other, and the third is it, the objects, first, second, and third person. Uh, Ken divided third person into singular, it, and plural, its, which I prefer to call those, or them, mm -hmm. or them those, or them <laughs> there. <laughs> <laughs> them those things. Things. Everybody has those three viewpoints, the inside of themselves, the outside of others, and all the objects that surround you. Look around the room, that's what your life consists of. Stuff. And so, the inside the, of a community. Well, there is also the group of I, okay? mm -hmm. that's the we. Mm -hmm. okay? So every person has an interiority, the sense of themselves as they are to themselves and their view of others is from the different viewpoint it's seeing them from outside so they look like bodies to the outside and they look like a self to the from the inside mm -hmm. but in actuality every body has an interior interior self an interior self sense and to them we look like a body so we have an interior and an exterior we have a singular that is me, myself, and a plural, which is we. Mm -hmm. And those four, I, myself, we, it, and those are the four so-called quadrants of the matrix that Ken Wilber developed. Mm -hmm. Now, I know, I'm, and I've just planted something on you. I've, I'm being yeah. a little ginger with how complex I get about this. But no, what I'm coming okay. to... It's fine. We, I think we, what, what the purpose is of our chats is not uh, necessarily elaborate the things between people who already know everything, but to bring it a little bit down to earth and to allow people who haven't heard so much about integral to get a taste of it and to begin to understand what it is about. So I think it's okay. But this description was very, very good. Yeah, it was. I'd like... I'd like to get back to the somatic line, as you That's see. That's where I'm going. Okay. okay. Mm -hmm. So, actually, I say somatic is actually a perspective, and it contains those four aspects. Every person, I'm going to pause here, and I'm going to say something about the word somatic, because the term is often confused. Somatic has to do with conscious embodiment. Your sense of yourself as you are to yourself is your somatic sense okay okay so all of us are somas every one of us uh, is a soma by the way so is your dog <laughs> especially <Hey>. him yeah <laughs> all living creatures have 
the attributes of somatic existence, which are four functions, attention, intention, memory, and imagination, or emergence of newness, growth, in other words. Every living creature has those four aspects. It's characteristic of all living beings or somas. Now, now that I've said that, I can talk about what we're dealing with here in terms of a perspective. The somatic perspective recognizing that we have embodiment, a flesh body, we have an interior self sense, and we have perception of the world, which consists of others and objects. So it is the most ordinary thing there is. All I've done is given a name to it. Okay? That's what the word somatic means. So now, when we talk about somatic development, it has to do with ordinary maturation. You start out as a dependent child, egocentric, concerned only with your own needs, and you gradually grow in inclusiveness to include others, first your family, then your friends, then society at large, then maybe your uh, ethnicity, your nation, the world, the cosmos. You see how I've stacked them up here. Okay. Sure. All of these are developmental potentials of somas or living beings. Okay. Yeah. Gotcha. So I came in through that perspective, and in that perspective, I was taught meditation. That's in the I space. Mm -hmm. I was taught various disciplines, uh, let's say physical disciplines, movement disciplines, and those movement disciplines, while learned in the it space or from the you space from a teacher, is experienced internally. So when you do Hatha Yoga, there's a feeling for it. There's an interior experience and an external look. Mm -hmm. yeah. And spirituality is nothing more than the progressive development of somatic faculties. It's inherent. That's what it is. They give the name spirituality, and immediately it implies some sort of wraith-like, uh, disembodied consciousness. Ain't no such animal. Yeah. It's always embodied in some form or other. Oh. This is so relieving because I have the, sure. the idea, not the idea, the impression when people talk about spirituality that they go somewhere mm -hmm. and leave the body behind. Yeah. And the more out of body experiences, the better. So, mm -hmm. yeah, that's a pathology. It's a it dissociation. Is. Now, what happened? Here's the really weird thing people think that they can transcend the body by somehow going into the consciousness. It doesn't work that way because. The effort of doing that is a contraction in them. It's an internal effort of stress. If you really want to be free of the mind body, you've got to go straight in and integrate all of the shadow material that is running rampant in your life. Integrate means to make, to recognize that it is, I'm going to say it differently because it's more than recognition. It's experiencing it as your own actions. Many of them gone automatic inherited from the family, the social culture, mass media, education. They're all memory patterns that have been inherited that have a corresponding external aspect to the memory, which is an internal aspect, and the external is behavior, what's observable by others. Mm -hmm. yeah. <clears throat> the internal and the external are the most ordinary thing there is. Spirituality is the inclusive <clears throat> awakening of our faculties. And remember I said unconscious incompetence and went through, I would call it superconscious competence. That's how I would state it. We go through all of those in becoming more and more awakened in our faculties, more and more intelligent, more inclusive, more discerning, more able, more creative, more finely responsive. Yeah, and I would also uh, add more able to, to, to handle oneself, the emotions, not to have so much fear anymore, and to see things in the world 
not so much from a narrow perspective, but be able to to be more relaxed, let's say. Even when you see horrible things happen, you are not oh, like this anymore, but you have, how can I say that? You are touched a lot, but you are not so, what did well, the Yeah, say? He, he says, it hurts more, but bothers less. Yeah. So, yeah, mm -hmm. I would say that. What, what would you say about that? There is, there is a measure of truth to that, and there's a gigantic pitfall. And the gigantic pitfall has been called spiritual bypassing. Yeah. As an, like some sort of idealistic effort, people try to smooth their way through the rough spots of life. It doesn't work like that. The way it works is when we have encountered our tendency, our remembered action patterns to react in certain ways, which have been on automatic and involuntary, and we recover our voluntary control of it, it relaxes and the accumulated mass of reactions from a lifetime of memories loses its binding force. It becomes more fluid and easier, not by ideally trying to be, you know, calm and have equanimity, but rather <laughs> <laughs> to have lost the grip of all of the reactivity that we've accumulated over a lifetime or from our species cousins. Mm -hmm. so that's yeah, I, I actually, I actually meant that, you know, and my own experience was I tried to be calm and everything, you know, until I understood that this was bypassing. And when I finally went into these patterns and, and really, I mean, I passed days of, of, of crying because, you know, it's so almost overwhelming when you understand what, in which patterns you are and which have mm -hmm. driven your life and but then it's also good because you can finally see what it is and you can choose not to be in the same way anymore you know and this is this is what i what i teach or what i do coaching for because it was for me it was really transformational this experience that trying to do things is really not the way but <laughs> facing who you really are or let's say who you really are in the moment, you know, how, the construct to which you are. And deconstruct all these, we, yeah. we call it false beliefs, false constructions, which we thought we are, you know, when we are able to see all this and go out of this patterns of this habitual patterns, you, you call it also, you call it memory, but I think it's, we are talking about the same thing. Mm -hmm. Then, then you, as I said, you, as my experience is I have much less fear. I have much less preoccupation about things and it's sort of falling away. These things, it's not because yeah. I want to push them away, <laughs> but they're, whoops, where are they? <laughs> you know? Yeah. Let me take a moment. I want to correct something here. Okay. It looks like my camera is kooky. <laughs> we see and you. I don't like a kooky camera. I like my camera to be upright. There we go. Okay. okay. So now, remember I said earlier, integration is the name of the game. And you just described it mm -hmm. in a certain way. Yeah. And I think this is what is so important to go on. Are you speaking? I don't hear you anymore. No, no, I'm not. No, I, I don't remember. Ah, uh, okay. I okay. thought so. I was listening. He's quiet. What's wrong? I often do that. Ah. Often. <laughs> <laughs> you can listen. Yeah. This is good to know. <laughs> well, it's good because I wanted to butt in with just a little personal experience of mine. Uh, because one of the benefits to me of integral uh, was the ability to reframe about the first 45 or 50 years of my life. Mm -hmm. and tell myself a different story about what actually happened in those decades and 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 realize that i had been dancing to a tune that had been created largely by outside forces uh and now i was with with uh, with integral insight i was able to reconstruct a new self and to take my own responsibility for all of the things that happened in those earlier decades 
and it has it has made it made me a different person and made me much nicer to be with thank you yeah <laughs> it's true <laughs> <laughs> yeah but that's the way it goes generally yeah so here's the thing again another pitfall we want to highlight is to think that we can go after those things with the mental faculty meaning the understanding is sufficient oh i understand why yeah. it isn't this but is this not is, sufficient but it's important it's important well, it's a handle. again it's a pointer but it's a pointer yeah. to the feeling state that underlies all that stuff mm -hmm. people often try to understand their way into another state and it doesn't work that way because the state they're in is mental state and you can't get out of the yeah. mental state through the mental state yeah. and that you was see, that was what freud thought was uh, sufficient i think in his work if well he was getting people to conf he was getting people to confront the resisted material in themselves and to have an experience of it and in some cases to have a cathar catharsis which is an event in feeling that occurs but it was always driving people into an awareness of what was unconscious in them. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I wanted to, to, to say a thing. Uh, I have now a client and she what well, is desperate. She is really desperate because she doesn't fit anywhere and she thinks something is wrong with her and, and so on. And her method, she has a very similar method, but she's working with animals or let's say with animal owners. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And, um, she had done psychotherapy, psycho, no, no, so if analysis anyway, for several years, and she said she knows everything, she knows where it comes from, and blah blah. But she she cannot do anything with it. Yeah. So you know, I, for me, what is so important now when you know the things that you don't let them stay there, but that you really, as you say, integrate them, is that you learn to transform it into a, a new way of being. You know, and this is what I'm doing with her. So uh, really excited about that because I think many people uh, feel that there is something wrong with them, but <laughs> they are only, let's say, further developed than others, and they feel so alone, and and they feel they cannot fit in, <laughs> and think something is completely off. And if they don't have anybody to tell them, no, you know, that this right. It is exactly how it needs to be and you must be fed up with your existence so that you can transform into the next uh, stage of development you know <clears throat> people need to know that and i think if we had known that a little bit before maybe <laughs> well we would never have met then we would have been happy someplace else no. <laughs> okay so we're, we're bridging into something i was leading to okay which is that mental knowing is not enough. What is necessary is internal self-awareness. Now, most human beings come through stages of growth in which we become more and more aware of the world around us. And if the person's really aware of the world around them, they're called worldly. And they're considered mature and sophisticated. <laughs> but it's uh it's <laughs> it's not there yet not because quite. the next necessary level of development involves the developing of interior awareness uh -huh. proprioception is the ten dollar word for it whoa it's proprioception self it's like the the perception of <clears throat> of the owner of the self so to speak mm -hmm. who's doing all this stuff well let's see it's all uh, my internal feelings are whatever they are that's the developmental process that people must undergo. It's not sufficient to know. We must also feel directly. And then the words can come out of the feeling and can describe the feeling, or the creative actions can manifest or make tangible the feelings. But first, the proprioception or self-awareness, internal self-awareness, which is not analysis. It's the kind of awareness we have when, say, you're chewing something, you feel your jaws moving. When you're feeling sad, you feel your chest feels tight around the heart, perhaps. Internal feeling, yeah. not the thinking analysis. Know. 
I want to, to put in something else of my experience. I was teaching singing because I taught myself singing and exactly by that, by feeling into it, feeling into your body, feeling when it is right and when it is wrong. And from there, create your own sort of grammar to know what you need to do and what your body needs to do. Because often we do as singers, they do too much. They must allow the body to do it uh, by itself. And it's often that the head comes in and, and wants to direct everything. So for me, singing is a perfect way to come into awareness of all these things, the uh -huh. psychological part, the physical part, the thoughts which are interfering uh, and the, 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 the ideas, what should be and you know it's exactly that it's exactly that that you can learn to integrate it but but first you you need to know <laughs> first you need to know otherwise you you're an automatic <laughs> yeah mm -hmm. otherwise in, in singing so many people just sing in some way and have no idea how it works and then there comes the first uh, problem uh, and then oh what is it and they don't know how to reconstruct how to refine their voice in their bodies, in their souls, in their minds and wherever, you know. So just, it's interesting. Mm -hmm. so that's and you should hear her voice. Mm -hmm. I'm no. sorry, what? Oh, well, you're describing a person who has that unconscious competence, mm -hmm. encountering a difficulty, and they don't have conscious competence sufficient at that moment to make the change. So they're going through that stage from um, unconscious competence now to conscious competence, and they become further and further masters of whatever they're doing by moving in that direction. If they do, otherwise they go into the unconscious incompetence. Yeah, that's right. Mm -hmm. Now there's always, by the way, a stage between the unconscious competence and the conscious competence, which I call the zone of incomprehensibility, which in the Zen tradition they call beginner's mind. And in the zone of incomprehensibility, we don't know what we're doing. We feel perhaps stupid. We feel lost. Even if we're underway in making the necessary growth process, we feel like we don't know. And people tend to resist that feeling because people want to feel like they know and thereby they pull themselves back into the unconscious competence or maybe even the unconscious, confuse the unconscious incompetence with the zone of incomprehensibility, which is their passage from one state through the unknown of newness mm -hmm. into the new competence. Yeah. And Absolutely. people must develop a tolerance and an appreciation for the zone of incomprehensibility. Many people spend endless years trying to get to the zone of incomprehensibility. <laughs> but they don't know how. <laughs> I think this is a question of uh, allowing it. It's certainly that. Yeah. So I think uh, it was a wonderful chat we have. We are at the hour. We have 45 minutes programmed for that. Uh, Lawrence, next week, I hope we have somebody else then too, if you want to come back. And all the viewers, I see. Did we give any comments? Oh, or? Tom has put a picture in. I asked him to put a picture oh, in. Oh, good. All right. Hey, Tom. Wonderful. Easy. Uh -huh. Yeah, and uh, connect with us. We would like to know who you are, OK? Write us a message or however you, you want to. Wonderful. So thank you, Lawrence. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, me. Oh, thank you, Heidi. Yes. Thank you, <laughs> For Lawrence. this chat. And yeah. it was really, whew, you have shared a lot of your insights yeah. and really well explained. Mm -hmm. And I hope our viewers could get the maximum of insight out of it and who will watch it on youtube please leave your comments leave your questions even here yeah. on the event page we will come back and answer them as far as we can otherwise we will chat again about the topics okay, mm -hmm. okay well, one more thing for people who thing. want to, be, to get access to the line of development we've been discussing you'll see in my uh, what do you call it inset window full spectrum somatics mm -hmm. and this is a blog and there's a clickable link there at least i think it's clickable that gets people to the place where they can hear very many facets 
of somatic education, which includes all of what we've been discussing, meaning mm -hmm. the superhuman operating system is a system of somatic education from the somatic perspective. And that's cool. Yeah, there thank you. Have you. It. All right. Thank you. This was a very good uh, uh, definition of somatic, which I've never heard before, and I really will internalize yep. that. Thank yep. you. I have much. to work on that a little bit because it's different than I would have guessed. Yes. Guessing mm -hmm. is not good. knowing. <laughs> we should bah, 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 bah. always ask the expert. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Okay. Thank you very much. And bye bye, everybody. See you next week. Okay. Bye bye. Bye bye.